good morning everyone here in india and uh, elsewhere hello uh, uh, today's first talk is by professor vincent fab you very kindly accepted uh, our invitation to give a talk in this event uh, and uh, i will say that uh, whenever you do not understand anything in between <clears throat> you may please stop him and ask uh he'll be very happy to answer your questions professor fa uh thank you thanks very much for the invitation it's a pleasure to be here i'm talking about an ongoing work with edward blianha who is now at university of chicago sort of a permanent visitor and we only have one paper it's um it's in JDG and it's called like Nielsen realization for K3 surfaces. And this talk is sort of on, there's a series of papers that we're still writing. So it's going a little slowly, but I'd like to report on some of the partial progress, but I decided to make this talk a little more um, like a colloquium talk than a specialized talk. Um, but so please feel free to ask me any questions you might have. So I just want to start out in a general context where MN is a closed and oriented for simplicity uh, smooth manifold. And the mapping class group, which I will denote mod of M, it's pi zero of the group of orientation preserving homeomorphisms of the manifold. So these are the homeomorphisms up to isotopy. So two homeomorphisms are isotopic if they're homotopic through homeomorphisms. And the main theme, um, why Edward and I started this project, he's an algebraic geometer. We started this project because uh, we realized at some point that the understanding of the mapping class group of a four manifold in 2020, when we started this project was basically at the level of our understanding of mapping class groups in 1973. In other words, we knew some basic things about Dane twists. We even knew um, uh, that the mapping class group is finitely generated group. Um, and that's about it. And people said, well, what else is there? And it's very similar. And so I would call this uh, BT. 1973 is BT before Thurston. And he sort of changed everything. There's there's Thurston. And our goal is to kind of change this. So it's a different point of view on understanding mapping class groups of four manifolds. Our original motivation is just, it's a basic problem understanding homeomorphisms of a four manifold up to homotopy or up to isotopy. But um, it also is common whenever you study a family of algebraic surfaces the main invariant of a family is its monodromy, and it takes values in this group. So let me just talk about uh, review briefly where the dimension the re uh, is two. So in genus zero, you have the two sphere, and it's a theorem that every orientation preserving homeomorphism of the two sphere is homotopic to the identity. And so the mapping class group is the trivial group. In genus one, M is the torus, in other words, there is a map from the mapping class group of the torus to the automorphism group of the first homology of the torus with Z coefficients. And that's GL2Z. And it takes a homotopy class of homeomorphism to its action on homology. And this is an isomorphism. The theorem is that this is an isomorphism onto SL2Z. And the inverse map is you take an element of SL2Z, let's call it A. A is acting on R2 on the plane and it preserves the integer lattice. So it induces an automorphism 
a homeomorphism of R2 mod T2, which is the torus. And so you just send that to the induced action, which I'll call phi sub A. And these are inverses of each other. Okay, any questions? And there's more to say, even in this case, because you can ask, given a matrix, what does the homeomorphism sort of look like? I'm not going to give a whole course here, but I will give some examples. In genus greater than or equal to two, so we're looking at the homeomorphisms up to isotopy of a genus G surface, G greater than or equal to two. It's known, it was known before Thurston that this group was finitely generated by Dane Twists, and I'll tell you what they are in a moment. But let me give you some examples. And let me say, there's no other name for this group. It's just, it is what it is. It's not like SL2Z when G was one. It's just a very complicated group. And let me give some examples. So the first example is when phi has finite order in the mapping class group. Um, uh, an example of such a thing is when you have a finite order diffeomorphism. So in this case, you, I'm in this case, here's a diffeomorphism of order four on a genus four surface that is just rotation. So you have interesting uh, diffeomorphisms and groups of diffeomorphisms. Um, there's a second kind of diffeomorphism called a Dane twist. It's a, really a diffeomorphism of a cylinder where it's a cylinder parameterized, say, from zero to two pi. And at time theta, you rotate by, uh, by, th by angle theta. And so you're preserving uh, foliation by circles. There's like a foliation by circles here. But it takes this green curve in the picture, a Dane twist about the curve alpha, the core curve, it's taking the green curve, and T sub alpha denotes the Dane twist. So it preserves alpha, because you're just rotating, it's leaving invariant each one of these circles and just rotating it. But it takes this green curve into this curve right here. This is, uh, this is T alpha of the green curve. And you can, and then you stick this picture on a genus two surface, and you can see that um, the green curve, uh, the image of the green curve, uh, this puts a twist in it. That's why it's called a Dane twist, and it's not homotopic to its image, so the twist is not homotopic to the identity. And you can do this for any simple closed curve, meaning an embedded loop. So any questions? And you can do what's called a multi-twist. You can compose disjoint twists, and in any order, they all commute with each other, um, and you can do that. But the typical homeomorphism is not of either of these types. If you look at the image of a simple closed curve alpha under a typical uh, homeomorphism or even diffeomorphism, uh, this is a typical picture of what it will look like. It almost looks like a foliation of a surface. And what Thurston proved, the model theorem that kind of kicked off this whole direction, in 1974, he gave a kind of trichotomy for mapping classes. What he says is that let G be greater than or equal to one, then any element of the mapping class group, meaning any isotopic class of homeomorphism, has a representative phi. So a representative phi, phi is a homeomorphism, orientation preserving. That's in the following form. Either your finite order, so you're exactly equal to the identity for some D, you're reducible, which means there exists a family of simple closed curves of isotopy classes of simple closed curves that are permuted by phi. So up here, if you do this composition of twists, then you're just permuting these curves. In fact, you're leaving these curves invariant. 
And the third option is what's called a pseudo of homeomorphism. I'm not going to give you the full definition. Um, the standard reference is a book I wrote with Dan Margulie called A Primer on Mapping Class Groups. But what Thurston showed is that there exists a pair of uh, singular, I'll say the words, measured foliations that are invariant. This is a picture down here of these foliations on the surface. And then you stretch in one direction and shrink in another. I'm not going to linger on this, but there's some geometric structure that's preserved. and. For experts, it would be like a projective class of measured foliation or a projective class of holomorphic quadratic differentials. So that's a key thing. It's, it's a kind of geometric structure that is preserved. So that's a situation in three manifolds. It's a kind of Jordan normal form. So it has many consequences. And there's something called like Thurston normal form. It's just like Jordan normal form. And there are consequences in the structure of three manifolds, Teichmuller theory, all over the place. And you can think of it like this. Before Thurston, we knew that homeomorphisms were every homeomorphism, every mapping class is represented by a finite product of Dane twists. It can be a complicated collection of curves that are intersecting each other. But we didn't know what a homeomorphism looked like. And it's basically like trying to study a Lie group without having Jordan canonical form, without having eigenvalues or eigenvectors. And there's an analogy where the eigenvectors are like these foliations. And I won't get into that, but I'm just saying that's what you want to know what a homeomorphism looks like. And um, so any questions, we're going to leave dimension. Uh, two now. So if there are any, I'll pause for questions. Okay. Um, for three manifolds, there's still some interesting things to do, but it's generally boring because if M3 is what's called irreducible, if it's not like a connect sum, it's pretty close to being not, a, it's not a connect sum of two manifolds, then the mapping class group, it's usually finite. So it's, there's not that much of interest. It's, it's just a finite group. It's sometimes a Z extension of the mapping class group of a surface. So it's essentially like the two-dimensional theory. So there's not a lot left there, at least in the irreducible case. So I want to talk about the case of four manifolds. And I want to tell you what was known and uh, yeah, there are two main directions of work that was known. So again, what I'm doing is I'm fixing a closed oriented four manifold and I'm looking at the homotopy class, the isotopy classes of homeomorphisms, let's say orientation preserving of M. And the two main directions of what was known, of what people have been studying um, are as follows. Uh, Paul Seidel, starting in his thesis in the 90s, um, people study what are called a version of a higher dimensional version of Dane twists, T sub S2, but now instead of about a simple closed curve, you can define a twist about a two sphere in M4. And it's supported in a tubular neighborhood of the two sphere. And the kind of thing, um, the kind of thing that Seidel studies and that most people have studied since since Paul started this is that the order of a Dane twist, it's order two in the mapping class group. So I should stop for a moment and say. 
when you're studying the mapping class group of any manifold, there are many versions. You could take pi naught of homeomorphisms, diffeomorphisms. You can fix a six symplectic form and take the symplectic mapping classes. So the diffeomorphisms preserving the symplectic form. And in dimension two, all those groups are isomorphic to each other. That's a theorem. In dimension four, those groups can be different from each other. And Seidel was a person who showed that, so you, it was known, it's elementary, that a Dane twist is order two in the smooth or topological mapping class group. But so you're, it's square. If you compose it with itself twice, it's isotopic to the identity. But he showed its infinite order in the kind of symplectic mapping class group. I'll just put simp. So it's not smooth. So it's square is smoothly isotopic to the identity, but not smoothly. It's a symplectomorphism that is not symplectically isotopic to the identity. So there's been a huge amount of effort in understanding symplectomorphisms and their differences in the smooth category. And I'm just, what I'm talking about is going to be completely orthogonal to that. The goal of our project is to try to take what Thurston did in dimension two. And I think we have a proof of concept that his whole point of view is pertinent to dimension four, even though it hasn't been studied at all in dimension four. The other main theorem, which, uh, which is a, let me talk about um, what's known about mapping class groups, is um, you consider, let me remind you what the intersection form is. On a four manifold, it is a symmetric, it is a um, bilit symmetric, non degenerate bilinear form. Integral valued. So it's symmetric. Just because it's uh, half dimensional in dimension four, it's bilinear, it's non degenerate by Poincare duality. And Friedman and Quinn, Friedman proved half of this and Quinn proved the other half. And this is from the 1980s, finished in 86 in a paper of Quinn, uh, proved the following amazing theorem. If you take a simply connected four manifold and you look at the map from the mapping class group to the automorphism group, of the second homology equipped with the intersection form. So I'm going to be calling this H sub M. This is a free abelian group equipped with a symmetric bilinear form. And so sometimes, uh, so I will call this O of HM, it's an orthogonal group of a symmetric bilinear form. And the map here, there's a map that takes an isotopy class of homeomorphism and just shows you how it acts on the second homology. And they prove that this is an isomorphism. Now it's completely non-explicit. Surjectivity. So Friedman proved surjectivity in his Fields Medal paper, and Quinn proved injectivity. And Surjectivity, for example, is completely non-explicit. Um, maybe I'll give an example. Um, if M4 is CP2, then the intersection form is a, given by a one by one symmetric matrix one. So the mapping class group is the automorphism group of Z. Um, so I think this is the mapping class group is uh, is trivial, and then for CP two cross CP two, you're preserving this bilinear form. So it's this positive definite bilinear form, and the mapping class group, it's the automorphisms of Z squared, equipped with the standard. Uh, by linear form, so it's like Z2. Wait, are I getting this wrong? Wait, uh, and I want it to be orientation preserving, so I think it's Z2. But the most important thing is that um, 
this is like an arithmetic group. This group here is sitting inside the orthogonal group of HM tensor R. That's a semi-simple, a real semi-simple Lie group. So this group, since this is an isomorphism, this is arithmetic. And you don't need to know the definition of arithmetic, but um, it's a group of matrices. And so you might say, well, now we know everything about it because it's a discrete group of matrices, um, like say the orthogonal group O1N of Z is an example. Um, um, but it doesn't tell us what a homeomorphism looks like. Basically, that's, as far as I know, that's where the topological theory of map and class group stopped that this was like all there is to know. But here's the goals of our project. Here's two problems I would like to pose to you to show you that the field is not over. So I would say this was a cold topic, not a hot topic. It's a cold topic and I love cold topics. And so the goals of our project, the first goal, a first goal is just understand Friedman's theorem given a matrix given an automorphism of this lattice of this abelian group. This is sitting inside some GLNZ. It's we'll give some examples. Find an explicit homeomorphism that induces it. In other words, the input is I'm giving you an action of a matrix on the second homology. I'm telling you how surfaces are being permuted in your are being mapped to each other in your four manifold and as the output i want you to give me a homeomorphism of the manifold that induces that and what do i mean by give it explicitly i mean find a best representative find a kind of thirst and normal form find for each element a kind of invariant geometric structure, determine when there are invariant foliations, maybe with singularities, uh, metrics, different kinds of Ramanian metrics, or complex structures. So um, kind of building a dictionary between kind of best representatives for homeomorphisms and uh, uh, actions on homology. So let me just, to emphasize this, um, this is just a matrix. You're given an A, that's a matrix that has a Jordan normal form. It's like, yeah, but that's how it's acting on the second homology. I want a kind of normal form for how it's acting on the manifold. And what I want to do today is give some examples. So today I want to concentrate on what we're concentrating on, which is K3 surfaces. And I will, let me tell you what they are. Okay. And then I'll tell you why we're concentrating on these. Um, so a closed complex surface. So it's a complex two manifold um, that's also closed. So I'm going to call it M4. So it's four real dimensions is a K3 surface. So these are manifolds equipped with a complex structure if it satisfies two key properties. One is that it's simply connected. And two, um, M4 admits a nowhere vanishing holomorphic two form. This seems pretty special. Why in the world would I why in the world would would that be a thing that studied? Why are there, when you Google, there's 10,000 papers on K3 surfaces? Let me say why, but before I do that, here are some pictures of the real points of these complex surfaces. So these happen to be complex surfaces where um, complex conjugation acts on the complex points of an algebraic variety. And these are kind of the real, the fixed points of involutions on K3. So they're two real dimensions they're one complex dimension. And so here's what they look like. There's different ones and they're very beautiful. And great. So 
Um, right. So my question is, huh? Why pi one equals zero and there exists a nowhere vanishing holomorphic two form? Why is that the thing you want to look at? Well, it comes up when you look at the classification of complex surfaces, there's, it's, it's more complicated than this, but there's essentially a kind of trichotomy, like at a very coarse level, there's a trichotomy. And the trichotomy you should think of like the trichotomy for real surfaces, which is like the genus zero case corresponds to what we call rational surfaces. in this classification. And these are the things like complex projective plane, a product of CP1 and CP1, so a product of two, two spheres, and um, some other things that are similar to this. Um, and these are kind of the simplest, just like the two sphere is the simplest. Then there's the ones that are like the genus one case. And these are, an example would be complex tori, so these are like diffeomorphic to four-dimensional real torus. So these would be something like you take C2 model lattice or K3 surfaces. This is a new thing that appears that just doesn't appear in the classical case. And then there's the version of higher genus. These are all just grouped together and called general type and they're not classified. So in the other two cases, there's a complete classification of rational surfaces and a complete classification in these genus one type of case. It's called Kadar dimension. It's not genus, but anyway. So it's trichotomy. So the K3 surfaces are occurring in this kind of phase transition. So they're the, they're just a huge jump in complexity from tori. So it's the first really complicated, but still understandable examples and typically general type, a lot of times those mapping class groups are finite groups. So this is sort of a, a crucial case. So these are the examples I want to discuss. And let me just give you some examples of K3 surfaces. I won't prove that these are examples, but I leave it to you as an exercise and they're fun exercises to prove each of these examples is simply connected and has a, you have to write down also a holomorphic nowhere zero two form. The first group are smooth cortex, cortex surfaces in P3. And what I mean by that, like an example would be the set of X, Y, Z, W in CP3 and that satisfy a degree four polynomial. So my favorite degree four polynomial in four variables that gives me a smooth manifold is the Fermat. This is like the Fermat cortex. So this cuts out a co-dimension one submanifold of CP3. So it's two complex dimensions. So it's four real dimensions. So any questions? Okay. So that's a construction, here's a totally different kind of construction. You can take a branch cover of CP2. Um, so here's like CP2. And then you can take, um, I'll call this, uh, oh, my manifold is M. So I'm going to have M and this will be it's a branch cover of CP2. It's gonna be a two sheeted branch cover branched over a curve C. This will be the curve C branched over a smooth sextic curve. So smooth degree six curve in the plane. That's a K3 surface. Exercise show that that's simply connected and find a nowhere zero holomorphic two form. There are many other constructions, um, maybe due to time. Let me just do one more cool one because it's Comer surfaces. 
So what you do is you start with a complex torus. So this is a four real dimensional complex torus. It has an involution on it that just takes Z comma W to minus Z minus W. And notice that you're a group under addition modulo the lattice. And this involution induced by ZW goes to minus Z minus W. It's an involution, so it's order two. And the fixed set of the involution, it's the set of two torsion points. The elements of order two in this group under addition. There exists 16 of them. And the Kummer surface associated to A is defined to be, you take the blow up at six, these 16 points. If you don't know what that is, don't worry. You're just replacing each point by the space of complex directions at the point. And then you mod out by the group generated by the involution. And amazingly, this is a K3 surface as well. Not amazingly, but it is a K3 surface. And there are many other things. I'll just say the intersection of a quadric hypersurface, so I'll call it threefold, intersect a cubic, threefold in P4, and there's other things. And the thing that I do find amazing, and it's not really explicit, but Kadira proved that all K3 surfaces are diffeomorphic to each other. So all those different constructions that I just gave you above, smooth cortex surface, a branch cover CP2, this, these Kummer construction, um, they're all diffeomorphic. So I would challenge you to exhibit explicit diffeomorphisms between them. Um, any questions? Okay, um, what do I wanna say? Um, one of the really cool things about K3 surfaces, you can either do it knowing those examples, but you can do it just from the definition, simply connected and nowhere zero holomorphic two form, is that H sub M, which would I, I'll just remind you, it was the second homology. So it's Z to the 22nd. I'm just telling you that with the intersection form. Um, so with the intersection form, it's isomorphic to a very specific inner product. So it's a 22 by 22 symmetric matrix that gives you the, the bilinear form. And I'm telling you what that matrix is. It's three copies of uh, the E8 intersection form and three copies of this. So it's called the hyperbolic. So it's a 22 by 22 matrix. And what I mean by E8 of minus one, it's a very specific matrix, which I should have had a copy on hand, zero, one, one, zero. So there are 22 homology classes, integral homology classes that generate. And they intersect in a specific intersection pattern. And I'll just say, there's this, the E8 diagram, I won't continue it, but that tells you the intersection pattern, like each dot represents a homology class of self-intersection minus two. So you have some like minus twos. And then if two, th two dots are connected, their inner product is one. And if they're not, the inner product is zero. So it's this amazing thing to me that uh, you start out just writing down an equation. You write down like x to the fourth plus y to the fourth plus z to the fourth plus w to the fourth equals zero. You look at the complex solutions. That's a real four-dimensional manifold. It's got homology and it's got 22 linearly independent homology classes. And the intersection pattern, all of a sudden you just wrote down this degree four polynomial and all of a sudden um, the E8 lattice pops out. And so our goal 
So Friedman and Quinn imply that the mapping class group of the K3, and again, there's one diffeomorphism type by Kodaira. So when I say the mapping class group of the K3 surface, I mean of that diffeomorphism type. The map that takes you to the orthogonal group, it acts on second homology. The map that just takes the class F to F star is an isomorphism. And this is the orthogonal group of like E8 squared plus U cubed. And let me just say, this is sitting inside the orthogonal group of this integer lattice, this 22 dimensional. You tensor with R, you get a 22 dimensional vector space. You can look at the orthogonal group. And this is, it has signature 319, this intersection form. And this is a real semi-simple Lie group. So I would say that's what, you know, the mapping class group is that group. And so what in the world is there left to understand? And I want to say, given a conjugacy class, A, so I'm given a 22 by 22 matrix, and I want to find a homeomorphism. There's actually an index two subgroup of the mapping class group that's representable by diffeomorphisms. So. And we want to sort of find a best representative and geometric structures. And I just want to give you a few examples of the kind of things we've been doing. And again, you can look up the first, uh, the only published thing we have so far that's uh, posted is a uh, is a paper. You can see Farb and Loyan Ha. It's a paper in, J, uh, in JDG um, with the word K3 in it. And what we prove is you're given, it's like the finite order case. There's still a lot more to do, but I want to give you a flavor for the kind of questions one asks. You're given a subgroup of the mapping class group of the K3 surface. And suppose it's a finite subgroup. What we show is there's a computable invariant. It's like a sub lattice of a lattice in homology. So it's a kind of, it's attached to the group G and it detects uh, realizability and non-realizability. What I mean by that is when you have a finite subgroup of the mapping class group, you can ask, is there are you realized by a finite group of homeomorphisms? Are you realized, in other words, given a G is there that's finite, is there a G twiddle that's finite? Is the natural projection, does it have a section over a finite group? Is there a finite subgroup G twiddle of diffeomorphisms giving you that, that mapping class? Um, so it's of diffeos, but you can also ask uh, K3 surfaces, there's a whole story here, but it has, Ricci flat metric by Yale, they have these metrics where the Ricci curvature is zero, by when can you realize them by isometries? And a third category is complex automorphisms for some complex structure. Now for Rion, for two dimension, two real dimensional case, the classical case, these three realization problems, um, isometries and complex automorphisms are, in that case, it's hyperbolic isometries. Those are equivalent, but we show that they're not equivalent and not everything is realizable. And we can apply this above. I'll just give you two things is that the Dane twists are not realizable by order two, by, by any finite order. diffeomorphism. In other words, if you take a Dane twist in a K3 surface, there are many Dane twists, there are lots of two spheres, and you can take a Dane twist and you square it. Um, it's isotopic to the identity, but you can't isotop the original Dane twist to have it 
so that it's square equals the identity. You see, so you can't realize it by an order two diffeomorphism. And I'll just say, um, it contrasts uh, my student, Serafina Lee, has a paper about blow-ups of the complex plane, and there, Dane twists often are realizable. So it's a pretty delicate and global thing, even though Dane twists seem to be local, they are local in nature in terms of their definition. And just another kind of thing I want to emphasize, we find a finite group, and we were able to apply our invariant. There's an A4 action on some K3 surface with a Ricci flat metric. but it preserves no complex structure. So again, this is the theme that a K3 surface, M, it has a smooth structure. It admits different kind of Ramanian metrics. It always admit, they admit different Ricci flat metrics. It admits many different complex structures. And for every mapping class element, you want to know, is there a representative preserving one of these geometric structures? So even for finite groups, um, there's a lot left to do, but this gives a flavor, hopefully, for some of the kinds of theorems. So any questions? So in case of topological mapping class group, uh, is there any uh, fine uh, element uh, in the topological mapping class group so that that cannot be realizable by finite or homeomorphism? Yes, yeah, so we don't know the answer to that. That's a great question. In our proof, we use smoothness. I was trying to like sneak that by you. So yes, um, we don't know the answer because the theory oh. of finite group actions is you know a lot more for smooth group actions. So that's a great question. We do know there are finite order non-smoothable homeomorphisms, which wasn't your question, but yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. Anyway, so that's a great question. That's totally open. And I don't know any tools in order to solve that, even though it's a very basic question. Um thank you. Thank you. And so that's sort of like this whole thing was about finite order elements. So remember the thirst and trichotomy was an element can be finite order, uh, kind of reducible or infinite or, or the pseudo Anasovs. Here, we already know the mapping class group is this arithmetic group. It's, it's the orthogonal group of the K3 lattice. That's called the K3 lattice. It's a lattice in a semi-simple Lie group, real semi-simple Lie group. So you can, you know, Mostow rigidity and Margolis super rigidity apply to it and stuff like that. And the congruent subgroup property and these kind of people who study arithmetic groups. Um, so when we say finite order, being finite order in the mapping class group and in this group are the same thing by this theorem. But you still want to know these realization things. The second thing I'll just say, I'll do it in reverse order. So case two, when you take an automorphism, so again, this is this 22 by 22 matrix. When it's semi-simple and infinite order, this is kind of the generic case. There are examples. The only thing that's known so far in this direction, there are some papers by Kurt McMullen who studies the dynamics of these examples. And he even does, unlike in the two-dimensional case, he studies their infinite order complex automorphisms. And this is a case that's still wide open and really rich, um, and we don't know yet. So um, the third case is, the, is what's left over, where A is para, what's called parabolic, so it like fixes a vector. So A is acting on the vector space H sub M and it's a fixing and it fixes some vector V. Okay. And maybe I will skip our first theorem, but I will just say um, you can first, well, I'll just mention 
we classify there's an algebra problem. So, so there exist 10 distinct kind of conjugacy classes of unipotent. Unipotent just means all the eigenvalues are one. That's a really special case, right, of fixing a vector. Uh, unipotent subgroups of the orthogonal group. So we sort of do it up to up to attention with the rationals. And for each of these, we have an explicit representative and a kind of best representative, like a minimal entropy. There's a whole story here that I'm not telling you, an explicit homeo representing it. I just want to end with an example here. I don't want to go the full hour here representing it. But let me just tell you, a major case is when you're given an automorphism of H2, and A of V equals V, so it fixes a vector in the lattice. So remember, that just means a homology class. It fixes a homology class. And let's suppose the homology class has inner product zero. And let me give an example of such a thing, okay? An example of such a thing is as follows. So what's an example of a homeomorphism, the, one of these four manifolds that fixes a homology class? And every element of H2, every element of H sub M here, it's represented by an embedded surface. That's just a general thing about all four manifolds. And an example, I just want to say there's another kind of K3 surface that I didn't tell you about. They're called elliptically fibered K3 surfaces. And what they are, it's a map. You have a whole, in fact, it's a holomorphic map to complex projective lines. So that's just the two sphere. And all but finitely many fibers. There are 24 singular fibers. I'll say what they are in a second. But all other fibers, elliptically fibered is more general than this, but um, all other fibers are tori, are two dimensional tori. And the singular fibers are all nodal. And what that means is that the inverse image of of a singular fiber. It's just a torus where you've pinched a curve. Sometimes if you're the algebraic, an algebraic geometer will draw this picture. You have a family of tori, one for each point in the two sphere. And then once in a while you get these singular fibers. There's like 24. And in fact, here's what a topologist's picture. So this is the algebraic geometer's picture. This is M. These are supposed to be a singular fiber. But here's the topologist picture. It's the two sphere. So I'm, I'm giving a picture here of like C hat. And I'm giving the unit disk here. And in this disk, there are 12 singular fibers. And in the exterior, there's going to be 12 singular fibers. So do you see them? There's like red ones and pink ones. And the typical fiber is like, this one in the center here, that's like a nice normal torus. And you've got the meridian and the longitude. And a good example to think about is that you have two kinds of your, as you move from the center to one of these singular points, you're pinching either a meridian or longitude. And so these are pretty complicated because if you just move around one of these, and you follow the torus, it comes back to itself by a diffeomorphism, so an element of SL2Z, and they alternate between these two different matrices. So there's a whole picture here. But the point is, it's like a fiber bundle over the two sphere. The generic fiber is a torus, and there's 24 singular fibers. And um, what I wanted to say is that notice, notice if, T2, you know, let me just call it F. If F 
is a typical fiber, just pick a smooth fiber, any smooth fiber. You can consider the homology class of F and it's not equal to zero in the homology of the manifold. Going back to this picture, if I take a smooth torus here and a smooth torus over here, I claim they're in the same homology class. Why? Because I just connect the points in the base um, by a line and take the inverse image. And I just created a three manifold whose boundary is the union of these two. I just created the homology between them. And so that's a homology class. And notice that f dot f, the intersection of f dot f is zero because I can take, I take my torus f and I can just perturb it off itself. I can homotope it off itself. And so they're literally disjoint. And so the algebraic intersection number is zero. So any fiber preserving diffeomorphism of a holomorphic uh, elliptic fibration, uh, any fiber preserving diffeomorphism F of M that takes fibers to fibers gives uh, F star is equal to A where A was our given thing, A of V is V. It fixes this V. So any questions? So that's an example where you fix an isotropic vector. Yeah, Professor um, Favre, there is a question in the chat. Yes, so I, I, infinite I, I, order means, yes, it means no iterate is homotopic to the identity. It means not finite order. And um, that's right. There's no, the powers don't converge to identity or anything, right? They're not homotopic to the identity, not isotopic. Um, so, um, but a, a theorem that we've proved, it should be up sometime soon, um, is just that the converse is true. Maybe I won't write the whole theorem down, but it's starting to build a dictionary. It says, given any element of the orthogonal group. So remember, what we're doing is, so what I'm saying is, if you give me an A, this is an isomorphism by Mike Friedman and, and Quinn. If you give me a matrix A, a 22 by 22 matrix, and it fixes a vector, it has an eigenvalue, one of the eigenvalues is one, Edward Luyen Hanai can produce for you a complex structure, a holomorphic fibering, where that vector that's fixed is represented by a fiber in a fibration, and the uh, the diffeomorphism is fiber preserving. So this is a maps version of a theorem of Moishazan, who just proved that every class is is an every isotropic vector is a fiber in a fibering. Um. And let me just give an example. Let me end my talk in the last four minutes, an example of such a diffeomorphism. There's sort of a whole story here, but I'm just gonna call it, um, this goes, we, we call these mord lv diffeomorphisms because if people know what mord lv groups are in number theory, it's exactly these. These are the function field versions, but the, uh, anyway, generalizations of. So let me just say, this is a really cool thing you can do. I want to build a diffeomorphism for you that preserves one of these elliptic fiberings. So let me just draw the picture since I'm running out of time. You have these tori, and here's, it's a bundle over the two sphere, so it's a four manifold. And then once in a while, you have these singular tori. Sorry, I'm supposed to, Away from these, it's just like a foliation. And these are all tori. And there's some singular ones. There's like 24 singular ones. And now take two sections, sigma one, two sections of the projection map, and sigma two. You have to find them, but suppose I can do it. A torus is a group. 
but it's only a group once you have to tell me where the origin is, right? You have to tell me where zero is. And so what happens when you pick a section on any given torus, if, if whoops, if let's just look at a smooth point. If you have a point, let's say P, this gives you the fiber over P, that's a torus, this pi inverse of P is a torus, but it gives you a base point and it gives you another point. And so I'm going to define a diffeomorphism on the torus pi inverse of P by taking a point of the torus and, and just translating it by the section sigma one of P minus sigma two of P. Think of a torus as like a square with the sides identified. It doesn't have to be the square torus, sorry, like a rhombus with this, right? This is a typical torus. And my section gives me two points. And so I just translate by that vector. I just rotate the torus. So you're rotating each of these. And this gives me a diffeomorphism of the four manifold. And the cool thing is, is F is not isotopic to the identity since I'm going to show you a homology class that it moves. Sigma one is non-zero in homology and it takes sigma one to sigma two. So there's a whole story here. There's like a Z to the 20th of these. And my point is just that these constructions in algebraic geometry, you're looking at them in this kind of Thurstonian point of view, meaning what do things look like? And in what way is this minimal? Are you preserving a complex structure? Here you're preserving like a singular foliation and there's a whole story. And I'll just end with the kind of summary of the talk. The first thing is that we conjecture there's a kind of Thurston type trichotomy or it's not a trichotomy, it's a 20 cotomy, but <laughs> uh, structure theorem for elements of the mapping class group. Today, we just did one kind of example, kind of some fiber preserving things, maybe some finite order. There are new structures that arise that are unseen in the complex world. So if you look at uh, a group of holomorphic automorphisms that take fibers to fibers, it can only be uh, rank 18 abelian group, but smoothly the, there's new things going on. It's rank 20. It connects to a lot of mathematics, which I'll show you in a second. And there should be a rich story. We just picked K3 manifolds. There's many other examples. And I just want to mention, there's a series of beautiful papers by Serafina Lee, if you go to the archive, and it's about diffeomorphisms of del Pezzo surfaces. And again, it's from this kind of totally different point of view than previous work, where you're really trying to understand these uh, what things look like. And I just wanted to end and I'll leave this on when I answer. I decided to write down so far in my papers with Edward, only one of which is out, but you can even see it in our first paper. Here are the topics that are involved in the project. And I realized, wow, it uses stuff from all over mathematics and it all comes in to understanding this. And I only gave a little bit of a taste today, but I hope I gave some flavor and maybe get you interested in taking a look at um, at least our first paper that's out. And with that, I'll end. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Farb. There are some questions, I think two questions in the chat. Can you please? Yes, I see them? one. It says for group actions, anything about the subgroups and their left or right double cosets? Um, I don't know the I don't understand the question. Maybe the person wants to to explain a little more to me the question. Uh, Ajit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, you may, when you take a subgroup, then you can have its orbit. And these orbits form a semi-hypergroup. Left cosets or right cosets, they form yes. semi-hypergroups. And double cosets form hypergroups. So I yes. was interested in knowing hypergroup actions obliquely I asked this question. Ah, okay. Um, 
Well, in these cases, if you have even like a single element, say, um, the coset, other elements in the same coset can have a very different behavior. That's the first thing. And also I would just say, this uses, when you have finite groups and you want to understand, are they realized by diffeomorphisms, you can, you have access, there's a whole theory of which finite groups, what are the actions of a given finite group on a given manifold? And which finite groups act on a given manifold by diffeomorphisms? And that's what we're using. It works for piecewise linear, but once it gets to just topological, which was the question earlier, um, there's very little known, or at least that I know. Um, so that's where we're stuck there. And the other question is, in this K3 surface, Dane twists are infinite ordered or finite ordered? Good question. So we can explicitly calculate the center of this map of this group. So Dane twists in the topological and smooth mapping class groups, they're order two. They're still order two in the mapping class group. In the symplectomorphic mapping class group, they're infinite order. So that's just a different group that things up to symplectomorphism. So, which we have nothing to say about because that uses a lot of deep, you know, uh, a lot of stuff. So, um, but then you can still ask, are you represented by a finite order diffeomorphism? Are you homotopic to something finite order? And sometimes you are, and sometimes you aren't. Um, and can you calculate the center of this mapping class group? Well, this topological mapping class group is isomorphic to this arithmetic group, and you can calculate the center. When you go to the smooth mapping class group, we actually have a bunch of results, which I haven't talked about today, that are um, that differentiate smooth versus topological, but it doesn't use things like um, Cyborg Witten, it uses a totally different method than people have used. Uh, it uses moduli, uh, different kinds of moduli spaces. Anyway, um, um, so you can calculate the center of the topological mapping class group just because it's an arithmetic group. Um, so things like that you can calculate. If you look at the smooth mapping class group, so diffeomorphisms up to smooth isotopy, um, we have no idea. It could be isomorphic to the topological mapping class group uh, or, or index two, but we, we don't know. There could be diffeomorphisms that act trivially on homology, but that are not smoothly isotopically trivial. That's called the Torelli group. And that's definitely a really great question that uh, we don't know the answer to. Any other question or comment? Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you guys for uh, for attending. Okay, so if there are uh, no other questions, uh, we thank Professor Farr for this very enriching talk. And uh, it is morning in India and we have been treated with so much mathematics. So thank you very much, Professor Fab. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. Thank everyone. And for anyone who's interested, you can look at this paper on the, I know it was a lot of stuff, but it's very concrete. And um, there are many, many open questions. And you don't, I will say, you do not have to know all of this in order to <laughs> work on this topic. You just have to know one thing. You know what I mean? Like to work on one thing, you just have to know that thing. But it, you know, uh, I don't want to scare people away by, you know, these are <laughs> these are things that come up, but they're not all necessary, of course. Yeah. Anyway, okay. Okay, thank you, Professor Fab, again. And